Star. Lovely to see Nick you, Joe. Nick good to see you again. From Arcade Fire to Lou Reed, from Nick Cave to Idols, you are my never hero. A never a day <laughs> off. But but you make the kind of records that I love. You make my favorite records, and you Likewise. made them. But you made them for decades. You're still making amazing records. Like I was saying earlier, I've kind of chased you. Your records were always inspiring me when I first oh, started out. We started out at the same time. Yeah. And I, I remember really working on an Oingo Boingo record and it just being taken with Midnight Oil and the sound right. of those records and trying to cop that drum sound, which I'm guessing was you trying to do the townhouse yeah, drum yeah, sound. Yeah, yeah. That, um, well, I learned, I, you know, I, I was an assistant engineer at the townhouse. This is back in 1979. And I was very fortunate to, to assist Hugh Padgham uh, and Steve Lillywhite. Yeah. And when I started there, it was the early days. Uh, well, it was, they, they were finishing uh, the Peter Gabriel album, the wow. third one, which has Intruder yes, and Beko of course. Yeah. and Games Without Frontiers. Yep. And so I didn't work on that record, but <clears throat> they were just tidying up and they were playing that record. And I was like, my God, what an incredible sound, the whole thing. It's an extraordinary record. And to me, to, to this day, it still is one of the best ever. sounding records ever, ever. made. Yeah. And so Intruder, luckily, luckily yeah. for me, I got on well with Hugh as an assistant and I kept getting put on his sessions and I was a huge fan of Steve Lillywhite and um, so yeah I got to uh, assist on an XTC album called Black Sea I love that album. and of course Hugh got that big drum sound yes. and then, yeah. then ended up actually uh, as an assistant to Hugh on uh, um, on Phil Collins first solo record which had in the, the air uh, tonight uh, face value yeah that had the <laughs> of course of course of course yeah so I, I was you know I was you were there for the drum sound it was just me and Hugh were in the room and Phil was out there we didn't know what he was going to play and uh, you know went in to record at the beginning of that song and waited and waited and Hugh was like is he actually going to play anything because Phil was out there just hovering over the drums. Is it, you know, like, was he playing brushes? What's going on? So you think there he had it a, yeah, planned that that's where he about, was going to oh, enter? I'm going to come in at the end of the song. And then suddenly, you know, I think he actually turned things up more because they were trying to hear if there was some brushes. And then suddenly it was like, dum, 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 dum. and I fell off my chair. I was on a high chair, you know, operating the tape machine and um, so I mean that drum sound yes it, it, it is that room that it's it's a it's a stone room and if you mic it up very simply in a certain way that's what it that's does the sound. I, I recorded so I, in there I learned how to do that and so of course the come the first record I made which was uh, Flowers of Romance with with Public Image um, I, I immediately got that sound there were no songs so I just got that drum sound and there was a great drummer um, Martin Atkins, oh. who's an extraordinary drummer, and he loved to play, you know, off of the sound. So I put that sound in his headphones, and so he would play parts that suited that drum sound, mm -hmm. which is honestly the only way you can do anything with that sound. You can't play cymbals. Or no, I was just, or even yeah, I've recorded in that room, and yeah, it's so nuts. bright yeah. and so cacophonous <laughs> that hitting a cymbal would really yeah, hurt. Just, yeah, it cut, yeah, cuts your head off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that so is, you know, and I think that drum sound, like you said, with with Midnight Oil, you know, which was probably a year later, and I'd already become a record producer by that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and they found me and we, we went in and so I got that drum sound and of course it, it suited some songs and not others so if you listen through to that album yeah, there are uh, some that, that it, there have got that big drum sound and some we were talking more. about Power and the yeah. Passion earlier yeah. and that definitely had that but some yeah. of the other tunes that are almost I don't want to say folky but simpler yeah. kind of tunes didn't have that kind of right. sound to them yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, and it was great that album you know um, 1098 is you know, it was an, it, a very odd marriage because I was really kind of it, into punk music, you know, being, I mean, I, I grew up in Spain, but I, we, my family moved to, back to England in 1976. When it was so all exploding. So, so as, yeah. a, as a teenager, I was going to all these punk gigs and that's what I was into. And, you know, and I had spiky hair and, 
all of that, you know, uh, razor blades and <laughs> all that crazy stuff. Nice. So, you know, when it came to working with public image, that was a very natural thing because, you know, I'd, I'd, be, I'd seen, I'd seen public yeah. image play, I'd seen Killing Joke play. That was all natural. But Midnight Oil, to me, were I didn't didn't know who they were. It was actually my girlfriend who, who I'd later married and have two kids with. Um, but the they, political side of the band would certainly tie in with everything that, that Sex Pistols or PIL yeah. was doing. So well, they, they wanted to make, you know, Nadia Anderson, who is my girlfriend, she introduced me to them because she was a DJ in, uh, in Melbourne uh, on, on the radio on um, Triple R, which is like the, mm -hmm. the government uh, radio station. And she played Midnight Oil and... and actually played uh, the birthday party in a lot of bands that I ended up working with. And so she introduced me to them and I went to see them live. And I was like, they're so powerful. They are, you know, some of the best musicians yeah. ever. I mean, and the, and they're tight in a way that n no other band, I mean, maybe Metallica. And a big You band know, too. like that kind of, they have that kind of heavy uh, tightness that is just the speakers are just going and uh, uh, the musically to me they were much safer than what I was used to and, mm. and also they were in tune and in time which I wasn't you know necessarily you know wow. that wasn't if you think about it all the bands <laughs> no, it in was England wrong. It was, was just all about yeah, it was energy. raw energy yeah. and vibe they weren't necessarily great great musicians these were the most proficient musicians I've ever known so for me it was really fun because I could get crazy sounds and they would go out on a, and their first take was just extraordinary so uh, uh. that album was it, it, it really changed everything for me I was suddenly like wow this is what it's like working with those kind of musicians and when you've got that kind of tightness you can actually have more parts going on because they fit that's right you know there's, I mean? there's more space for yeah them. Yes. and so uh, and it's it, it sort of, um, I, I don't know, I, I had, a, had a great time, and they're such lovely people. I mean, yeah. just But how did you people. record Peter's voice? Because, and maybe coming from all those punk records, it was easy for you. But when I think of the roar and yeah. the bigness of his voice, I mean, it would blow out anything. And it's, you know, big voices are, people think, oh, they got such a big, bold voice. It'd be easier to make a record yeah. like that. Well, it's he's such really a character, you know, and, and he's, he's a huge presence in the room. I mean, not only in size and stature, yes. <laughs> because he's whatever, six foot four yeah. or something. But he, you know, and he's very, he's very political. And I would say um, very politely um, opinionated. He has a very strong opinion. Mm. And, and you know what it's like when you work, like I'm sure when you work with Morrissey, that it's a very strong opinion. And Nick Cave is another strong opinion. I find when you work with bands that have a singer uh, that is a character, and, a, and has a focus and almost an impatience because they just do what they do. They're not going to listen, they're not going to change what they do no. for, for reasons that have to do you with commercial things. You've got to create a lane like for that. them. They are Let who them they be are. Them. And, and Peter in particular, you know, he's not um, a typical singer. And he, although I've seen them recently live and he's bang on in tune, back then he wasn't. So it, it was a challenge in in that way, but I, you know, as you said, having having worked with a lot of bands where being in tune and vocals was not what it was about, I wasn't bothered by that. And in fact, I think that Midnight Oil, if they had a, a let's say a, a singer singer, it, it would be, be a much thing. more sort of blander band. Absolutely. Not not because the music is bland, but just because they're so proficient. Mm -hmm. And when you have a proficient band that plays very accurately and you put a very accurate singer on top, it, it, it becomes that thing. You know, it becomes more like, let's say, Rush or Yes or something yeah. like that. And yeah. they didn't, they're not that band and they didn't want to be. Right. And I think that's why they chose me because they met me. I mean, it was the craziest meeting I was probably 20 21 years old amazing I was living with my mum and my I had uh, my bedroom had this 
fluorescent green carpet, very punk rock. <laughs> And it had these huge Tannoy speakers. Oh, I mean, nice. the biggest Tannoy speaker, like studio speakers. Right, like 15 inch and coaxial. They came over and they all huddled in, you know, and they're all tall, uh, you know, they, the, the, the two guitar players are also like six foot three. So they're all in there. And, um, and I just blasted, um, like, Release the Bats by, by um, the birthday party. Yeah. And, and the Kate Bush thing, you know, the, the, some of the Dreaming album. And, it's all very left and it's all very odd and they were just like you know the expressions like one of them was like they didn't I get love, birthday party oh my though? god this is incredible how are and, and others were like oh god this is this is a little bit too far you know weird wow but weird. i would have thought at the time birthday party would have been like sort of the cult hero but of i don't Australia. think they were coming from that wow. place you know they were more they were, they more, were more mainstream they were into the who and the Clash, wow. you know, the Who and the Clash were the, the main things. I mean, the Clash, they, Clash, I, the, can I see, think, of I think, the rest of the band, in particular, were very aware that they had this singer that was a, who was a character, and not necessarily a singer singer. So they kind of like, well, what other bands out there, who are who are great bands, are there that are like that? Well, the Clash, yes. and politically, yes. the Clash, they aligned with the Clash. So I think it was a case of maybe when they started out, they maybe saw themselves as perhaps the police or or ACDC or somewhere in between. Wow. But then as it went on, they sort of like, no, we're more political. We're all about politics yeah. and we want to make a difference. And we've got this incredible singer. And so I, I definitely remember that um, th 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 when they met me, and talk to me, it was very much about wanting to make a really radical record. Wow. And to make it, because they, the previous record they did with Glyn Johns, mm -hmm. and it's an extraordinarily good record, but it does, it kind of sounds like, a bit like The Who. Right. Uh, and it's, you know, for those times it was safe. It sounded safe. It was a great rock record. Right. But it wasn't pushing boundaries. Right. And so, I was obviously really young, uh, you know, when you're that young, you're not, you're just doing what you feel. That's right. And I, I was just feeling, you right. know, anarchy. <laughs> Great. I was just all about like... Yeah. And you're not thinking of the politics of the no. record business or the manager or the, no. you're just kind of going for it. Yeah. You love the band. You're just trying to do what they want to do, but 10 times that. Yeah. yeah. So it, w it was a great marriage, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it's a great record. And to it's this day, classic. it's a great record. It really, it really is. Yeah. And and we got to cut forward now, thirty years or whatever, <laughs> to my new favorite, which is Idols. You did right. Ultramano, yeah. And in some ways, there's some tie-ins there oh, with definitely. the drum sound, yeah. uh, the kind of and the politics. angular yeah. guitars, the politics for yeah. sure. So. I, I want to know how you got that drum sound. I want to know those guitars because they're so aggro and in your face, but but not in that you know metally overdriven kind of way. They have energy, but they're that sharp, clean punk rock right. thing from the eighties. Yeah, I mean, I think with the Idols, you know, I I mixed the previous record, mm -hmm. the Joy record, and I have to say, I, you know, I did this with uh, Adam Greenspan, right. also known as Atom, who, so Atom, uh, you know, had been my uh, assistant and, and engineer for something crazy like 10 years. We oh. worked together a lot. And so come the mixing of the Joy record, I was doing another record, I can't remember what it was, and I just couldn't mix the whole thing. So I mixed, um, I think, four songs, four or five songs on it, uh, and he mixed the rest. And so, but what, for me, what it was, was as soon as I heard them, I was like, I know what this is. Exactly. This is, this what is, you grew this up is with. Killing Joke, it, it's yeah. public, it's, it's all the things, and I get why they've got in touch with me. Absolutely, it, this is a no-brainer. So I mixed, um, you know uh, a, a couple of the songs uh which are kind of mostly the singles and um it, it it was and i mixed it in my house because their budget they had no budget you wow. know they were not, not pretty they were they were not a known band 
apart from in England a little bit. And so I just mixed it all in Pro Tools and I just went to town on it. I mean, I just, the recording of that record was very uh, characterless. It was very dry. Nothing had room sounds at all. So what did so you do to I get just, the personality? Well I, well, I just distorted it. I mean, I, I just used uh, a lot of Decapitator and a lot of, uh, you know, Devil Lock. Yep, I think Devil it. Lock on practically everything. Great. And I just... <laughs> yep. And then I, I did do a little bit of, um, you know, um, sending some of the drum, the overheads, which were just overhead, they weren't like room sounds. I ended up sending them to an amp, guitar amp, and micing it up in my living room and, and doing things like that to try and get some life out of it. Yep. And, you know, and I did what I did and I, you know, and just made it really bold, sent it back. And, and they loved it, you know. And, you know, when, like I said, it was all very rushed and all that. But I really connected them, so I hadn't met them. Uh, months later, uh, I was in Barcelona for uh, Primavera. Oh, yeah. They were playing, that's when I first met them. I actually met them in a, in a Spanish restaurant, which was really <laughs> nice in Barcelona. And they were just so nice. And Joe, of course, is just like, oh, yeah about character uh -huh. I mean he, you know you see him and he looks like he's just got out of prison exactly he's gonna thump you. yeah 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 and he comes out all right you know, <laughs> thank you so much for mixing our record you know it's, it's, he's just I just love him and uh, and the whole band and you know Bowen who's one of the guitarists is like the most diplomatically nice person you could ever meet wonderful and he's funny and uh, they're just a great band so anyway but I want to yeah. know about the the even just the drum sound of well, Ultramar. Well, so, so partly what I've told you leads up to this because it's important to see the chronology of this. So whatever, a year later, it's like they wanted me to produce the record. Mm -hmm. And Atom had done something. So me and Atom produced that record together, mm -hmm. you know, 50-50. So we both went over to England to rehearse mm -hmm. and then we went to uh, this studio which I love called called La Frette. Oh which yes, is in, in well, it's, it's not not by La Fabrique, but but uh, it's well, it's actually it's it's, it's about an hour north. It's of north, Paris. yes, correct, yeah. And it's a it's a, a really it's really a residential old mansion. Yes, yes. That, that obviously belonged and was built by a very 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 rich person. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place, but it's it's in somewhat of a of disarray huh. in a funky oh, it's an old way. Neve console right and it yeah they've got the most beautiful Neve console I don't know where it came from mm. but it's it, 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 it actually works really well it's got very it's got a few crunches but compared to most desks of that era, yeah. uh, era it, it works really well and the studio is not very big it's literally the basement of this house and you can use the other rooms uh -huh. in it and and many people have but I'd worked there before I did um, an album with the Bad Seeds mm -hmm. uh, called Skeleton Tree. And that, so oh, you I did that there? there? Yeah, we did that there. And um, Push the Sky was done at uh, Push the Skyway was done at Fabrique, which thought. is yeah. down yeah. You know, yeah. uh, near Marseille, yeah. which is a much more luxurious. Of course, studio. we we, we love, love we love Fabrique. We love Fabrique. That's our second yeah. home. Yeah. Love so Fabrique so is, our is like quite a different experience, uh, but just as just as good in many ways. But it's it, it's it's funky. You know, it's it's a, uh, and the rooms are not very big, but at the back, of, so there's there's one sort of room that's all carpeted and pretty dead. There's a booth, also very dead. But at the back, there's this other room that honestly looks like some kind of medieval uh, jail. It's all stone and it's slightly arched. Uh, and you can see it's got massive, uh, not bricks, but you know, well, I suppose they're bricks, but they're, they're big. It's very, very, very old. Mm. And it's, we're underground. Right. And I went in there and it's just cluttered with synthesizers and, and junk. Uh, I mean, there's actually about five fair lights there because the owner, wow. Olivier, was the importer and representative oh, of really? Fairlight back in the 80s. Oh. Lovely, lovely guy. And they're all sitting there, and then, and there's not a lot of room. You know, it, it's kind of a storage. And I was like, "That's the room. That's the drum room." So it is actually very, very similar to the Townhouse Studio too, wow. in, in its structure. And it's not as tall, 
but it's got this stone. It's all stone and the floor is it stone. covered with that plaster like uh, in the arcade room at La Fabrique? Because I always find that French plaster has a particular sound right. to it. It's not like no, the stone yeah. of those uh, Hidley uh, Westlake rooms. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's the, the, this room at the back of uh, of the studio was perfect, you know, and I used it with the bad with the bad seeds a little bit and. Um, now the thing about that Idols record that is very important is they were touring so much that they only had eight days to record the whole, the whole record. The overdubbed, whole record. tracked, overdubbed, everything. not mixed, obviously. Not everything, but you know, but mixed. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, they're that type of band yeah. where they can do that, of and, the, and the drummer is so amazingly tight. Yeah. And all that. Yeah. You know, it's it, it's like three takes of each song you, you're going to be good but the guitar stuff too is so tight and feels really sculpted well, and it's, just it's, they're, they're, they are just that good so wow. this was the setup we had the drummer in this stone room which was very similar to studio two and just a and couple just of room mics that, yep just a couple of 87s compressed and we had a lot of close mics we sure. had some doing this some doing that and they were different songs we used different ones in the mix i'm saying we because i have to include atom in this because he, he you know we did it together and and then um the two guitars <laughs> this is talk about chaotic so I wanted everybody in the same room because that's how I always do it. No matter where the amps are, you can put the amps over here in that cupboard upstairs, downstairs, um, whatever. Same right? thing. Yep. But the band have to be in the same room. Absolutely. So the two no guitar iso players, yeah, yeah. the two guitar players were in the room with with the drummer, and their amps were in the next room, which is this dead room. Now, they bought lots of amps, and so it was one wall, you know, of Bowen's. Uh, amps and one wall of Lee's <laughs> amps now and they're all turned up the all, max. Wait a minute, all on at the yeah, same time everything's all plugged in I mean we were using three amps each at a time with some had distortion pills some basically you know the, the approach because we only had eight days to get this was just to record as much as possible of different amps so we get it and then mixing we could choose this amp and that amp and put this out of phase and and decide because it was just it was almost like it was like it was like going to the jungle for eight days and capturing as much of the animal magic as you can and then That's how what long it was like. how long did it take you to mix two months maybe three it was a very very long process mixing it wasn't like continuous but it was it was long process because of your process of choosing things yeah or the band's feedback and and the, a bit of both uh -huh. basically the the recording process was capture the madness uh and then then it was sort sort the madness out not to say that we were tightening them up but it was a case of like we want you know the guitars on the chorus to to change sound so use different amps but it might be the same guitar take because all the guitars and bass that you hear on that record are live it's all live there's some overdubs but not that many um so if you can imagine this um there's two walls of guitars all facing at each other wow and then the two guitarists are in with the drummer and then the bass player Poor bugger, is actually can't he? Can't, there's not enough room for him in the drum room, so he is in the guitar room. So he's playing bass, looking through these glass doors, Surrounded. with this wall of sound going. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know how he could hear what he was playing, but somehow he did. Wow, but it's so tight. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing I love that it has this punk rock kind of energy but it, it, it you know when things are super tight like that they come at you like this yeah, yeah. wall of sound and it yeah. really does well that's it you know if, if you, you see them live you you, you can hear that you can feel that yes. energy and it was just you know i i'd seen them live a few times uh by this point and and atom had too so it was very much like we just got to capture this yeah. and we've only got eight days so we had to set it up so it they could play live 
And, but the other very important thing, very, very important thing was Joe because the energy comes from sure, Joe. Yeah. So we had to have Joe doing live vocals. Uh, so the only place for him was in between the two glass doors from the control room, much like this studio. You know, it's like you've got the glass door and another glass door, and there's this little area, it's like a cupboard. Well, Joe is in there just screaming, doing his thing, yeah. screaming and shouting, you know. Amazing. You know, <sighs> and he's, he's all like, you know. Yeah. And off they go. and. You know, the other thing about the energy of that band, a lot of it comes from the discipline that they have. They're they're like um, they're like I'm, I don't know any other band like them, honestly, as far as the dynamic between them, because Joe is like a, a, a sergeant in the army, and they are like the soldiers, and he barks at them, you know, with a lot of love. But he, he's, you know, mm. his volume is loud wow. all the time. Wow. And he's a very charismatic and lovely, caring person. And, y you know, that comes across immediately when you meet him. But nevertheless, there are rules mm. in that band. And one of the rules which, which astonished me uh, was that we like, so they go out, we'd set it all up, they go out and do a take, and it was like, <laughs> and we're like, oh my God, that was incredible. Yeah. Uh, let's do one more, and like, why? You know, it's like, oh, could just do another one. Okay, do another one. They come in and listen, and they all had ideas and thoughts, so they're all like talking over each other, as you, as you do with enthusiasm. And Joe, you know, goes, hey, old lads, what are you doing? And they all look like, he said, remember the rules. Put your hand up first so they had to put their hand up to talk and this is just how they are and it makes sense of course because right? it's always chaos right? it's always chaos yeah so then then you go bowen and then bowen would say bow up then lee and so on so it would that's why it was possible to do that record in such a short time because it was like right we're doing this song first we're doing this like this, 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 yeah. yeah bang 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 and then this is also incredible about this record. When we went to uh, rehearse in, in Bristol, where they're from, mm -hmm. right? All we'd heard was some demos, rehearsal tapes, no vocals at all, oh. right? It was just grooves. When we got there, Joe had some of the lyrics and he sang those and they were like, wow, they really fit because you know most of their th their songs are that groove there's a gro there's a verse groove there's a chorus groove and there might be a middle eight right but it's it's basically a repeat it's a yes. loop and, yes. and it builds and it builds and then, and it gets wilder and then it, you know i mean th that is right. essentially post punk exactly. right exactly that's what the gang of it's four not this did. complicated the, musical yeah. journey yes it, it's very like the yeah. gang of four and um so but it was amazing you know we we would go into the studio and everybody's there and we're about to record and we go right which song do you want to do joe because he and he says i can't do that one i haven't written that one yet let's do this one i'm ready for that one out they go bash it out incredible wow right and then you know you'd have a lunch break as you do in france yes. right you'd have a two-hour lunch that's break. right and it, that was also funny because they said we don't need lunch we'll just have sandwiches of course as soon as they tasted the french food it was like a two-hour oh every time i go to so la fabrica I come back 10 pounds yeah uh, it's amazing yeah. but we uh, i want to know specifically that drum sound so okay. uh, the room obviously is giving you a lot of it but are you putting it in a culture vulture are you distorting it are you doing the gating thing are you doing what what's the process so, so, it, so it's pretty much um the the the, the room sound is two 87s mm -hmm. you know neumann 87s through the neve a lot of top end and mid-range to and then it's compressed with two uh, uh 1176s mm. Just on on you know on uh, you know what what is it ratio two ratio or four ratio four, four ratio four one, yeah. and it's it's not slamming as in like that it's just but hitting yeah it's a fair amount the thing about eleven seventy sixes I find is that there's a a, mi a mid range 
boost around 3k that's right which you know when you use it on vocals can be problematic because you get a lot of yep. s's and it's a problem yep but with like a drum sound, or drums yeah it's yeah. good because it gives you that edge and it's kind of nasty in a good way yep so that's really that that would be generally i mean that, and honestly i've been doing that since yeah the get-go i mean originally you know, I used to record and mix on SSLs because that's all I knew. And, and that was, but you didn't use 1176s then. No, I didn't. That I just would have been the, the console compressor. Yeah, I used yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And but it's only when I started going right. on to, yeah. you know, APIs and Neves that I started you using 1176s. We're trying to chase but the I, sound. I use the different compressors for different reasons. Yes. Like for vocals, I always use tube, tube techs, you know, ah. the, the big blue CL1B. One, yeah. One one yeah. 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 And because they're. They react very quick. Mm -hmm. They're actually exactly like an 1176 in how they work, but they don't have that mid-range boost. That's right. Because you don't want that for votes. That's right. I yes. find. Yeah, I, I find that 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 little in the 3K area can yeah. help a singer that needs a little bit more energy, yes. a little bit more projection through the track. But sometimes that can be a little nasty, especially yeah. female voices. Yeah, yeah. are very rare that exactly. I would Exactly. Yeah, female. you kind of want the opposite. To yeah, happen. exactly. So yeah, and um, as far as the rest of the drums, I mean, um, kick drum was probably. I mean, sometimes change. Like I sometimes use an RE20 or an M. Uh, you oh, know, a Bayer. Yeah. 88. Uh, and uh, I, I love Bayer 88s. Yeah. I use them on guitar amps. I use them a lot. They're like the European version of the 57, aren't mm -hmm. they? They're like a three, $300 mic. But Smoother. Just incredible. Yeah. And when yeah. you EQ the low end into an 88, you get that, that yep. note. That thumpy the thing. Boom. Yes. So and and your kick drums always have that. I, it's I've always it's, that's noticed what it that, is. It's a, that, it's that a you really ATA. do have that. Uh, they're tight, uh, but they always have a kind of focused bottom. Right is what I'm trying to say. And you have that thing. In fact, you know, uh, 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 specifically on grounds or model village or some of the other tunes on their record i always feel like they're scooped out in a right. way that there's room for the instruments but you never lose that kind of knock on right, the bottom right. where you really feel the kick is here yeah i mean in the in the mix so in the mixing of that record the band kept on going on and on and on about wanting more low end and we're like you know th there's a limit to how much low end there is on live rock rec rock music slows it down right yeah. and so it became an actual kind of issue of like trying to explain that to them and in the end i said look you know you're comparing this with hip-hop records and hip-hop records are not live drums they're programmed drums or they might be a loop but they're enhanced and anyway cut a long story short we ended up um, a lot of the kicks put samples ha have, in. have a, a triggered, uh, but it's dynamically triggered, like exact. It's not. Uh, it's not like a one velocity. Thing. Yes, yeah. it's literally yeah. off of the. So to add the extra loan, but the lo a lot of it is actually sans amp. I I get I always do this, um, and especially I've done it more and more as time's gone. Even on the Amel and the Sniffers record. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could go into the mixing of that record quite a bit, but it, it was a similar thing to the Idols where Amy, uh, the singer from Amal and the Sniffers, kept on saying um, like things like, oh, I'm, I'm listening to the record, uh, I I the mix, and I'm, and, and I'm listening to other records, and it, and it doesn't have the low end. And I'm like, what, what rec records <laughs> are you listening to? <laughs> Kanye, T.I. So I was like, yeah. okay, this is actually the same. It seems to be a trend now. A absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I've definitely found that over the last 10 years that my sense of low end, it's no matter what different. genre music I'm mixing or producing, is very different. I'm yeah, very, very focused different. on it. It's very big. To me, groove is... Everything, Everything, even yeah. if it's a little folk 
record. It's got to kind of move you because yeah. I think we're all in this time where everything we listen to has a great sense of groove and yeah. bigness on the low end. And if your record doesn't have that, it, it just feels like there's something wrong with this. Yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah, uh, especially if, you, if you're in a car and a lot of these cars have subwoofers. If there's nothing down there, it, it's not going to do anything. Right. And, then, and then, of course, you put on you know a Billie Eilish and it's like boom, boom, and it's fantastic and you just go well musically it's both so of different, these right? are, are, va are, are doing a great thing in, a, in their different ways but is it possible to have a rock record with that kind of low end and it is and, uh, and I, I, the, the, I think the Idols record in particular absolutely is, is that because you put that on after listening to hip and it does it, have it. that low end but the reason it has it is because we made an incredible deliberate uh, thing it's almost like we mixed you know you know these days we mix in the, well, I, I, I mix in the box so me and me and Atom we have very similar setups with our Pro Tools deliberately because what we do is uh, and on that record he'd pick a song I'd pick a song we mix and then we send it to each other wow that's we so have great yeah yeah oh. I mean me and, me and him have uh, I would love that we ha we're, we're both into exactly the same music nice uh, but he's American I'm yeah. English yeah. obviously I'm much older and so we have a slightly different yes, attitude yes I get it I get and it and so I tend to add things that he might not add and he tends to add things that I might not add so that record is, is a combination, combination of, of both of our things and, yeah. and you know uh, he's he's like I'm more I'm more uh, vi I just go for it I don't I don't look at what I'm doing I'm just and, and as, as, then it suddenly does something and I'm loving it and I don't question it. Yep. He's very like, oh, have you heard this new plug-in? New plug this, 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 this. He's really into all that. So it's great to have both because sometimes I'll go like, you know, I'm really happy with it, but that isn't sitting right. And so he'll go, oh, I found this plug-in called the, I the, can the fix whoosh that. machine or right. something yeah. and and, yeah. and send it back and it's got, and I'm like, what is this? And But it does the trick. So it, it's, it's an interesting time, right? Mm -hmm. Because when... I started making records and, and you started. There was a limited amount of equipment. That's I mean, right. there was really like eight pieces of outboard yep. that you used <laughs> consistently, right? And you knew the settings and that's what you did. And there was nothing else. Now it's literally thousands. And like you say, thousands. it changes yeah. every day. Yeah, and and I find my my choices of plugins are changing all the time because yeah. something new comes along or there's a better version of an emulation that's got more bandwidth or whatever it is. So the process is always mutating yeah, you know yeah. where you know you came in your favorite mix room use your favorite gear and yeah. off you went and you were done mixing in 10 days exactly you know yeah. but i mean i still i still my brain is still doing the same process as i did when i started yeah and in fact i can say this as i learned more because bear in mind when i started making records I was 20 and I didn't know what I was doing. Me too? Yeah. No, my I, my first records with Frank Zappa, yeah. I was 20 years old. And they're some of the best, right? Because you because when you do things by instinct you, and you don't really technically know what you're doing, you do crazy stuff. It's all from the heart. Yeah. And and those are the best records. And what I found is the more I learned, certainly dur as the 80s went on into the early 90s, I made some horrible records that are unlistenable in my opinion because they're way overthought there's way too much going on yes oh, it's just too too clever yeah and i think i woke up to it uh, uh partly i think working with nick cave and that whole world coming back uh was was great because because of his impatience wow nick nick is just so focused and, and so impatient about everything that happens. Well, we because should talk he, about yeah, yeah. we should talk about Nick Cave. We should talk about your time at La Fabrique because I've done. So we're talking about doing time. We're talking doing about doing time, time in people. the doing time at the south of France <laughs> yeah. in one of the most <laughs> posh places in the world yeah. with the most incredible sunlight, where yeah. you walk around and you feel like you're inside a painting. Yeah, yeah. And but yeah. let's talk about Nick Cave. La Fabrique, Push the Sky was the record you did there. Yeah, there, yeah. That was the yeah. first one you did with Nick there, right? That yes. Yeah. That was the that was yeah that was the first time I went yeah. there. Uh, yeah. 
I want to know some of the techniques, but I also want to know about how Nick and Warren work together and how you work with Warren, because I just think the collaboration between Warren and Nick is Lennon McCarthy. Yeah. It's it. They just fill in in some wonderful way yeah. that they understand each other and their aesthetic and the choices that Warren makes. It's a brilliant yeah, combination yeah, yeah. for Nick. Oh yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing. It's like Batman and Robin. Really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> their, their bass player uh, um, said uh, said one day. It was like there was something frustrating, and he said, "Fucking Batman and Robin," <laughs> and I thought it was so funny. I I, I I I mentioned it to to Nick and Warren, and, they, and Warren goes, well, "Which one's Robin?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not Robin. <laughs> and Nick goes, well, I can't be Robin. <laughs> I want to know, like, on some of those songs, or how many of those songs are are you looping things? Because certainly on, on you know, um, Let Love In, there's a bunch of loops on that. And is Warren doing a lot of live looping, or are you it's building all, from loops? It's all live. I all mean, live. It, it's it, it's funny that we're talking about idols and 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 the bad seeds. You know, very similar. In that you've got a very strong, focused, you know, singer, lyric writer yes. uh, that that's driving the whole b band, uh, and 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 similar in in the way. I mean, I'm using this word a lot in, in patience, and I don't mean that as in a bad thing. Yes. Because impatience can be wonderful because it Absolutely. makes you focus, right? And you don't procrastinate, and therefore what you do is very pure and and quick. But you know, I've worked. I've done albums that have taken nine months. I've done albums that have taken two years. On average, most albums that I make are three months. Yes. Okay. Idols and Bad Seeds. It's like a week, two weeks max. Right? So, so push the sky. The tracking happened in in a week. Yeah. So and how did Nick gave all, get all all that sun tanning in? All, all I remember hearing is yeah. he was out of the garden well, that, bronzing all day long. Well, that's because you heard it from people yes, out Isabella. there. Like he was, that's true. He was out there a lot. Well, I'll tell you the answer to that. So and so bear in mind that what was the previous record? Dig Lazarus Dig. All oh, right. right. So Dig you Lazarus did that too, Dig. Right? Yeah, 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 it's a great yeah, record. Dig, Dig Lazarus and Abattoir. Blue, oh. Flower Orpheus, and Nocturama. So I, 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 the first, you know, I did Birthday Party mm -hmm. in 1980. Oh. I did that, you know, Release the Bats. And then I didn't work with Nick for 20 years. Not for, there's no reason of course, for it. People Basically, he went to Berlin, and I went to actually Australia. And I had you know, two kids and did, did that. And then, funnily enough, uh, just before moving to Australia, I lived in London. Had a big house in uh, in in sort of uh, off Labrook Grove. Hmm. He bought a house about eight doors down from me. <sighs> Bizarre in this street called Dalgano Gardens. I was looking out my window at this park, and there was a kids playground, and I saw this tall man in a suit with a little kid, little you know four year old, five year old. Always the suit. Always. Yeah, when, and when he I records like, the suit. It. It, and, and I called uh, Nadia, uh, I said, who's that? She said, that's Nick Cave. So I went out and went up to him and hovered around. And of course, he's like, and he goes, can I help you? You know, and I said, um, yeah, uh, uh, my name's Nick, Nick Lorney. And he goes, yes, my name is Nick. Um, and like this. And I said, no, no, my name's Nick as well. I, I said, I. I worked with you on Release the Bats. He said, oh, did you? What did you do? Because he, he couldn't remember. I looked different. You know, this is, this is 15 years later. And I said, oh, well, I, I recorded it and produced it. And he said, oh, he said, that record sounds great. You, you know, he said that that record really sounds good. He said, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't even remember what country we did that in. Because at the time, you know, he was, he was yeah. doing all kinds of, course, of stuff. Of course, yes. And uh, I reminded him, I said it was just done down the road actually. And so then, you know, that's when we kind of connected again. And, you know, I, he ended up, you know, we ended up doing shit. You know, my kids were a little older, but actually, no, I'm about the same age. I think my daughter and his son's about the same. But anyway, that was that. And then a few years later, uh, I'd, I'd moved to Australia. 
uh, um, actually a, a few months after me meeting there and then anyway there's a long story but I ended up in the studio with them uh, doing this back this album called Nocturama which mm -hmm. was which was literally done in four days Wow that album and, and so anyway going back to this focus thing um, Dig Lazarus Dig I believe was done in five days wow. and mixed probably it, mixing took a lot to longer and you do a little o overdubs while mixing and crazy stuff like that so I get this call from Nick about the next down which is going to be Push the Skyway and he says you know and he, my name he calls me Moa because of being Nick and Nick it's too confusing so Lorne Lawn Moa mm. Moa so or, or Mo he goes, so he goes um, Moa he says um, uh can you find a studio somewhere residential? Uh, I really want to, um, this time, I know I'm really impatient, and I really want to uh, spend a good amount of time on this record. I'm, go I, you know, I'm gonna work on my impatience and, you know, and gonna, you know, give it some time and, and you know, experiment. He said, I want to experiment. I know we don't usually have time for experiment. I want to experiment. And I said, well, how long do you think? And he said, two weeks. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's like two weeks. He said, all right, all right, three weeks. I go, okay, great. And, and then I started trying to find interesting studios. And actually, it was Nigel Godrich yes. told me about that studio, although he'd never been there. Never but been knew there. Maxime and knew about the studio. Yeah, because he, he has a house uh, down yes. in the south of France. So he said, oh, I've heard about this studio. They've got a website. It looks really good. I haven't been there. So I looked at the website, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, Nick Nick ends up uh, flying down to have a look at it because I sent him that. And he said, oh, it's south of France. I'll go and have a look. He goes in, he calls me from there, and he says, Ma, I'm at the studio. I've looked around, and they've got no overhead lighting. So I've booked it. Because obviously we're all losing our hair. And so overhead lighting is Not a big... Me. We can't have overhead lighting. But that, you know, that, I mean, he's hilarious you know I mean people know by now that, yeah you know they used to think he was a very serious yes and he was pretty bloody serious yeah. but he's you know he has an incredible sense of yeah. Yeah. But anyway that was the phone call he says no overhead lighting I've booked it I said great so he booked it for three weeks and and I'm not kidding about this we recorded the whole album in the first week we did overdubs in the second week and the third week we took those overdubs off that it's true. It, it, we we basically did the, what is essentially the record that you hear in that first week, including the vocals, because all the vocals are live. Yes. And the way it works is the musicians play around his, his vocal, vocal, and yes. his, there's no clicks, there's no tuning up. Right. It's all just vibe, Happens. you know, yep. and capturing. Yep. And that's, you know, my my production technique with them is very different to other, yeah, other bands. Your production technique, I would imagine, is being prepared, being yeah, ready, getting having, everything yeah. running perfectly, dialed well, in I as dial close as possible. dial it all in before he gets Exactly. It. So you're like a Bob yeah. Dylan session. Yeah. You walk in and go. Well, as soon as Nick walks in, it's on, yeah. and you push record. Yeah. I mean, I'm not kidding. As soon as he walks in, you push record. Right because he's going to go, right, be ready, and he'll piano. start playing. Yeah. And that first take might be the one, and very often is. And it's it's uh, uh, that thing. So it was kind of funny that we had three weeks. So in, our, in answer to your suntan, why he was the suntanning, that was done during the third week, <laughs> when there was nothing to do, because the album was kind of like, yeah, well, it's kind of great. And so it was a bit of experimenting, but all the loops that you hear, that's all Warren. Warren is doing those with, with his, his loops. Yeah. Usually it's a, this thing called a boomerang. And right, it has I love those, one, yeah. even tight one, I think it's, I can't remember what it's called. They, they make these. Yes, they make it, yeah. So he, he very often has uh, his equipment that, that, you, that he's always and has. Is, does he have loops prepared before? No. So he's he just, just grabbing something Sometime, while I mean, they're going. The, the, I can remember occasions where he'll he'll play something and he's but it, when it when it's prepared before it's because it, he prepared it that morning or the night before and I don't think it's always like a case of oh I'm gonna do this for that purpose it's he, something happens and he comes right. up with something and he puts Inspired. it in and then he tries it because um, I mean push the sky away 
is definitely a more experimental record than, than any of the ones before, mm -hmm. uh, in that it has got a lot of... of uh, uh, Warren, that's the album where Warren shines. I you think know, so, yes, that's, it, absolutely. It all, it, before that, it, they're, they're more kind of rock records in mm -hmm. a way. They're, they're blues based yeah. and it's their band yes. records that one is this you know this this one song with the kind of drum machine on it which was had never happened before and and there are these loops you know there's that one loop i can't remember which song it on it's going oh yes i know what you're talking about yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's got a, root, a groove to it mm -hmm. you know and, and, and so the groove is in the in the groove is in the loop and then the vocal so, so also some of the vocals to that, uh, which m might surprise people, um, they're uh, poems or stories yes. that Nick has written uh, with the idea that they might be songs or they might just end up in a book of his. They're just these stories. And he, because he has that incredible voice and uh, he'll go out there just in and, and so you'll get a, a loop by Warren that's going and Nick will go out there and then oh yeah so then you know Thomas uh, or, or, or Jim either of the drums depending on what kind of thing we want because they're very very different yeah we'll just do some right, right to that and and you know and then Marty will be out there the bass so they're all out there just like a live recording but this loop is running from his pedal it's mm -hmm. not like it's put to tape and we've decided this is going to be a song how are we going to do it no it's Warren goes oh I've got this what do you think of that and, and I'm, I'm get a sound on it and we've got the amp in that crazy so room to the side you know that big cavernous, oh the marble room yes yeah, the yeah. Big cavernous oh room. I love the sound of that and room so we had one amp in there and we had another one in so that were you other. processing the loops a lot yeah distorting, distorting them or them whatever and, yeah. you know putting delays on some I mean I usually had four different, I had a DI and three different mics in different places. You don't know what's going to happen. And then the one that resonates the most, the one that has the most interesting harmonics or makes it groove the most, and I DQ bass into it because some of those loops, you know, are just waffly low end that's, that right. doesn't do much. But sometimes you, crap, you, you, you get something. this thing that goes boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, right. boom, boom. And that's and it's a just an artifact itself. that's in the loop, yeah. and you're able to boost it and capture. So that's that's it becomes, you know, what is the production of a record like that? Well, it certainly isn't demo, rehearsal, record the best take you can. No, it's chaos is happening out there, and it's beautiful, and you've got all these mics up, and it's it's going to happen. You push record. And sometimes they turn into nothing, and sometimes they you never heard again. There's a lot of recordings, I'm sure, from that session that I can't even remember that are brilliant. But it, it didn't happen that day. That day, you know, right, the magic Nick's wasn't. Vogue, the Vogue, he didn't. It, whatever. Yeah. So it, it's it's very much a case. And Nick, Nick will then narrate. Let's say that you know he's talking the story, and it works and it's good. And then. Warren will have a little string idea that he'll put in the little break and then we might move that so there's a bit of editing so th that album was more like that but here's the thing sometimes we then go and there'd be another loop or piece of music that happens with a different vocal and we're listening to it and we'll go hang on what about take that vocal from that one and that vocal and swap them Nice. And we did that, and that that happened, and and that's how it is on the record. So, because the timing of Nick's narration sometimes isn't rhythmic connected right. with the loop, it can float loop. over. It's it's just, it, you know so, and there's, you know uh, so with Push the Sky Away, there's actually I think another four songs that uh, were released as separate uh, a separate EP. Um, uh, I can't remember all the names of, of those songs, but they are the same. Mm -hmm. If you listen, they're actually the same record. So the, that Push the Sky was only eight songs, right? Right. But we actually recorded, I think we probably recorded 16. In a week. Yeah, in a <laughs> week. And some of them never got finished. And the ones that did, some of them are sort of B-sides. Right. Uh, there's like Animal X is one. And um, yeah, they, I mean, 
There's a lot of it's a Greek mythology. And, yes, yes, you know, it's great. It's all that stuff. Fantastic. So, well, let's talk but that's about how that. That's that's how that record. Very unusual record, yes. and, and actually one of I think one of the best records. I think uh, so too. The Bad Seeds made favorite. one of the best records that I, I've been involved. I love that record. Uh, that that period with Lazarus and and, mm. and the mix is we. I mixed that record at CD Underbelly in here in LA. They came over, and we did do a couple of overdubs. Like the backing vocals were all overdubbed here. Mm. Uh, in LA, uh, the kids. Oh were, right. The kids were done in France. Uh -huh. That was like a local local school. Yes. In uh, uh, what's the Saint Remy? Uh -huh. Saint Remy. That's I mean, they were all like six, seven year olds. That, that was very funny because Nick was conducting them. Yeah. Wonderful. And, uh, well, we Warren, and Warren Warren speaks French, so Warren was talking to him in French. Perfect. And there was a very strict school teacher who kept telling the kids off, and it was it was funny. So, Mr. Ciccarelli, I have a question for you. Okay. Which studio did you start at? I started at Cherokee Studios, which is unfortunately no longer here. Right, in, like the townhouse. In, like no the townhouse, there. that's yeah. right, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah I, I did an Elton John record at the townhouse, and great experience. Wow. But, but uh, my start was here at Cherokee, when, same thing as you, when I was 20 years yeah. old. Yeah. And I was an assistant and got to work with Frank Zappa. But wow. yeah, that was my first real record what, what that was I had. What he like? Brilliant, Nuts. absolutely <laughs> no, just just absolutely brilliant. Um, really knowledgeable about a lot of things from recording, certainly to music, to politics. A workaholic, right? Yeah, that's a perfectionist, uh, but respectful of people. Somebody you wanted to be around, and just like right. you say. Uh, focused Very, yes. leader impatient in all the best ways never rude or pushing but just drove you to be a better version of you and for me in particular drove me to experiment right, right. Uh, always pushed me to not do the normal, right. not do the, the straightest, most proper thing to really, really, as Frank would put it, fuck shit up. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. He always but wanted so to go to the top. Was he technical? Did he know? No, a knew little enough, bit? knew of what, uh, he knew the things he liked technically, uh, had some ideas how to get them, uh, was not like the guy to say, you know, uh, higher compression ratio or right, right. any detailed thing like that. But, you know, occasionally, you know, he would say, you know, you could process, process that more. You know, we, we were always experimenting. Like, I remember one time we did this thing where, because he would love to layer guitars. And right. there were always crazy uh, stereo tracks of guitars. With, he loved his Eventide processors. And um, we would sometimes stack, you know, couple of dirty tracks, right. couple of clean tracks, and then we'd go in and experiment and go, what happens if you put 12 dB at 3K yeah. on this guitar, yeah. but this guitar you put 12 dB at 4K, nice. and this nice. one you put 12 dB at 5K. Yeah, so all the harmonics would be in, in different places. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then you sneak them in spots. So, he's, so yeah, it sounds like he had a bit of knowledge. Bit of that. knowledge, en yes. en Enough to be dangerous. Enough to be dangerous, yeah. but enough to give you a place to start from. Right. And then he'd just say, you know, go for it. And it was really, really great for me because it really got me to come up with different techniques because I was always trying to do something really interesting to yeah, kind yeah. of impress him, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, he never, ever wanted things to be too clean. That's the only, if he ever said anything negative to me, that was it. It sounds too good. Too, it sounds too, yeah. too, 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 polished. Too, too polished. Exactly. Like, yeah. just put some character in it. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it was great. We were always, like, putting amps in the toilet bowl, putting, doing <laughs> <laughs> vocals, putting the singer inside the echo chamber and doing the vocals in the echo chamber and and just like, you know, ganging one compressor into the next, into the next, into the next, and just 
doing things to really come up with something that had personality. And I think that's ultimately really what this is, yeah. is really, really coming yeah. up with a character, coming up with a sound, coming up yeah. with something that, you know, speaks like nothing else speaks. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, 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 that to me is like the, yeah, really yeah. the key. D- and did he do his vocals with the band or did he over- no, a I, more overdub kind of? I don't recall any time that we did any live vocals. They were always later. He was maybe a little insecure about doing vocals. Um, uh, He had a a big voice. I always used an M49 on his vocals. The best mic ever. 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 Stunning sounding microphone. Uh, Etta James, I would use an M49 on. I mean, you just can't go wrong with that. No, it's just. That's that's what you. Nick on all of Nick Cave Rogers M forty nine. Perfect. I mean on, honestly most records I do that's what I use. Wow. Always. I mean I just put that up. I I don't even bother with other things. Sometimes I'm, it's a little dark for me. Yeah. Or more pop yeah, music I mean, is a little dark. Oops. Sorry. Um yeah, um yeah, I, I sometimes like actually with, with Joe from Idols, we use this mic God, I don't even know what it's called, but it's it's called it was stealth. It's a stealth called a stealth mic. It's this black thing that's it's a new mic, and it's just got this incredible grit and low end, wow. and it worked really well on him. And I've used that since on on loud singers. It's very good, like SM7 type of yeah, mic. Yeah, it, it's but yeah, more tone. exactly like an it's like an but it's thicker. I I, I should um, yeah. So are you tiny like? I should I should know the brand. Yeah. Give them a plug. Exactly. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you can put that stealth up in, mic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, um, well. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, that's great with the uh, with Frank Zappa. I mean, I've always, I, I sort of with Frank Zappa's records. You know, you have to be in the mood for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's a thing, yes. and. Um, uh, but I, but my my mum used to listen to Frank Zappa. Your yeah. mother listened yeah, yeah, to yeah, Frank yeah. Zappa. Yeah, she did. She was really a, a, a very cool. Wow. Mom. And um, my dad was very very cool too. But he was very into theatre, so he was listening to theatrical stuff. And my mum was listening to to rock, and, wow. and classical music. Loud. She would play like Rachmaninoff, like super loud. Like, well, that's so probably loud, why she liked Zappa yeah, because exactly. a lot of his stuff was very classical, yeah, totally, like that. And you totally. know, as you know, he later went on to make classical or yeah. neoclassical yeah. records. So makes sense. Yeah. yeah but what an amazing guy. No, they were uh, great, great times for me. Really, we really did unique things all the time. Yeah. And well, I'll say yeah. I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and did that lead? in some way to Oingo Boingo was there any uh, you know the, goes, the connection there kind of like was um, that a friend of mine had moved out here wanted to do some demos we went in the studio did these demos together basically you know I would sneak into Cherokee at midnight or whenever they would be quiet yeah, yeah. and give me a free afternoon or whatever and we did these demos and he got a record deal at A&M and David Anderley who you probably know right. is the yeah. head of A&R for A&M for years loved these demos and called me up and said I love the production of these demos and I want to sign this artist and I want to sign you up to produce this wow. record. And that's and so unusual. Very unusual. Because very often the, the, the guy who does all the hard work gets early no on credit. For no money for, and no credit and often it, gets like exactly get pushed yeah. aside. Yeah. So he was like, we're going to put this out just the way it is. And no remixing, no nothing. This is going to be an EP and we're going to put this out right now and then we want you to go in the studio and do a proper album and and then he said you know and i have this other artist on the roster that i think you might be good for he said you know do you know Wango boingo and you know i had just been here maybe a year or two then in la they were a phenomenon and so of course i knew them and knew all about them and and when i got to LA early 80s it was all about punk rock yeah. and I was definitely part of that scene and so I just was like yeah I'd love to be yeah. a part of that record so 
I got introduced to the band, went to their rehearsal. We all hit it off and uh, decided to do a record together. It was their second album. It's called Nothing to Fear. And we uh, did it at, at what is now Pulse Music Group. Right. At the time, it was called Soundcastle Studios. It just happened to be a place I was working a lot at. They had a 8108 series Neve and a good-sized live room. Not huge, but good size and good sounding really high ceilings and I remember I was using shotgun microphones that I would put over the drum kit and sometimes gate and it gave me this kind of nice kind of pop but um, ambience on the snare and um, but that record I kid you not I was really in some ways chasing the Midnight Oil record oh, right. because they well, had there's a, there's that chaotic energy yeah, yeah, yeah. and certainly I a can, bigger band in terms of the players and instrumentation and um, was really trying to get that massive energy and mm. because you know I remember that, that that record when it came on the radio it it, it just was f a force and I wanted mm. this Oingo Boingo record to have that kind of madness to right. it that made you like you know turn it up in your yeah. car yeah. you know yeah. so um, that was really that's really, really interesting because I, I remember listening to Oingo Boingo and, go, and going thinking god this is there's so much that I, I get about this and how it's you know and the production and the sounds are all like you know it was you know sometimes you hear records and you know that they're just there's some magic and it was captured and thank god it was captured and that's that's what that is and and you love it but there's other records that you go someone was very deliberately making this work and it's very clever and you know there's there's this stuff going on here that you know, is yes, it's the band, but yes, it's the, you know, there's the producers doing this, and yeah, it, it, it's I mean, it's very, it's very clever. No, it's, it's clever funny how stuff. we can hear yeah. that now, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and uh, the great thing is that listeners don't hear that. Yeah. You know, you don't want well, them when to they hear do. That. That's when it's not very good. That's and right. I, I certainly guilty of making some we records all, that uh, were overproduced. Uh -oh. I mean, I think that was the thing. It like the eighties it just built up and built up with technology and it, and it got to a point where you could you could uh, you know big production and overproduction was actually fashionable but I, I, listening back now it doesn't you know it, it has doesn't not sound aged so good well. not no, at it all. Hasn't, yeah. no we got to really quickly talk about one of my favorite bands which you have mixed two records or one and a half records one, for yeah. and um Arcade Fire, from the first moment I heard them, I was like, wow, this is special, this is unique, this is from Montreal, this yeah. didn't make sense, but there was a beauty, a sense of orchestration, a great sense of storytelling, and Regine's vocals, to me, are like the hook of that band, yeah. because they're this, this crazy, almost like little girl thing, but they give it such a signature, yeah. and you were part of well, two of their great... accent. Yes. You know, because even though, when, you know, when she talks, it's like... English is like her first language, but she, you know, obviously also speaks French. And um, but she has that slight, f I French accent. There's a, there's an accent in there, and I think that's what makes her vocals so so great. But yeah, that, I mean, an incredible band. I mean, it's like a big family. You know, they're all, um, yeah, they're just all they're they're like this. Wow. I mean, it's, I mean, my, I I. Found, first found out uh, about them through David Byrne because I did a, I did an, uh, an album with Dave, David Byrne in the mid 80s one of his second solo record which is called Uh Oh which right. is a, it's a pretty complex yes. record it's a great record um, and remain, remain friends with him uh, you know ever since and occasionally we meet up and stuff and, and he sent me an email just saying Hey, I've just uh, seen this band, and they very much remind me of what you do. You should listen to them. It was just that, and and then I did listen, and I thought, wow, you know. And there's, you know, some of it reminded me of Joy Division, some of it reminded me of the Gang of Four, but it was very melodic. So it almost has this almost like Beatles song or John Lennon, you know. I, I that's what I I heard in it. I thought, well, 
and it was raw mm -hmm. because their first album, first album they, they produced it themselves yes. and it's you know it's not perfect mm -hmm. which is why it's so great yeah and anyway that happened I listened to it so I was aware of them very, but they didn't seem to be it wasn't like they were being played you know they were just very very like some of my cooler friends were listening to them and yeah then one day I, you know I get this email uh, from their manager Scott, Scott Rogers saying very polite saying hi Nick um, we haven't met but uh, I'm aware of your records uh, I manage this band that you probably won't have heard of called Arcade Fire where you know the band have made a new record which they produced and they're getting to mixing stage and they need some help would would you be interested in in mixing uh, a song or two anyway I immediately responded yes I actually I do know about them Dave Byrne told me about them and um, and then of course it turned out that he had actually told Wynn about ah. me so d they was definitely the connection there and so but here's here's the funny thing about this so I'm I'm in LA you know living here and uh, you know did, to do all this work I was working at CD Underbelly this studio in it's like a house home studio uh, very prop. It's very actually. It's based on. It's based on. That's right. Uh, yeah. Suns, it's a studio three. Sunset yes. Sound. Yes. It's the same. Almost the same dimensions. Isn't it? So it's a great studio, and so I get sent um, the. Let's see, was it a multi track? It, I think it was not a multi track. I think it w it was a pro pro tools session, uh, of this one song, and it's on a on a you know on a CD. Uh, with the, with the files, and I I receive it. I un you know open the envelope, blah blah blah, and it's it says Tony Visconti on it. Like so so the FedEx package, and then there's a Jiffy bag, and the Jiffy bag says Tony Visconti on it, uh. and I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> I think I'm a yeah I'm a hugely oh, influenced by love Tony. Tony. I mean, uh, uh, Steve uh, Lillywhite, White, Tony yeah, Visconti, of course, the, the Brian masters, Eno, the and the other other record producer that I'm influenced by is David Bowie. I mean, those are the four people yeah. that I'm most influenced. Yeah. By. So, and I'm a huge fan of Tony Visconti's engineering yes. and, and mixing. Yes. I mean, Scary and Monsters, the string is arrangements. Yeah. 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 Oh, I mean, great, great. Yeah. He's great in every way. But like his drum sounds and bass his sounds on on scary monsters you know on ashes to ashes is one of the, my favorite Incredible, records of yeah, all time absolutely so anyway i see tony visconti there and i'm like that's a bit odd and i thought i won't i won't put i won't think about that too much um so I, I start mixing this song and it wasn't one of the singles uh i think it was called ocean of noise no, i think something right. like that uh and so i kept mixing i was so mixing it and i i couldn't help but think maybe they want it to sound like Tony Visconti, you know, uh, or maybe they're getting Tony Visconti to do a mix. Or anyway, obviously there was some Bowie-ness about about the band. Anyway, I could hear that in their first record. So I kind of mixed it with some things that I thought were Tony Visconti-esque, you know, like harmonizers on the drums, nice. and things like this. Nice. Anyway, I did this mix. No, I've never. I haven't spoken to the band. I haven't met them. I, I, you know, I, I know. I know very little about them as people. I send it, and anyway, a week later, whatever they go, love the mix. Can we send you more? And so I get more, and I m mixed. I think another song or two, and then sent that back, and then it was like. Uh, then the conversations on the phone started with Win, and then it was like, "Can you just can you come up? We can't all come down there. We're still recording the record, and there's a lot of us." So you went to their studio in Montreal. I went up to Montreal. Actually, it was the studio in a place uh, out in the countryside. <laughs> Not the old Morin Heights, was it? The, the studio? No, because that was no. This was, was their, torn down. no. This was a church. Oh. that they had bought and converted it into a recording studio. Ah. They hadn't really converted it to a recording. Right, it right. was just a they church. They put gear in there. Yeah. yeah, they put gear in there and the, the control room 
you couldn't even see the recording room. It was way up high, and it was this triangular-shaped room. Uh, echo, I mean, it was just all over the place. And I, at that time, had never mixed in the box. I'd never done it. I was still mixing on The API, desks. yeah, yeah API. Yeah. So I go up there, and they've got this uh, Calric, Mm -hmm. Broad BBC broadcast desk. Mm -hmm. So it has no mutes and no solos. And it's very limited with its EQ, uh, no automation. And they had Logic, not Pro Tools. Now, I wasn't that great at Pro Tools anyway, uh, so that wasn't like a big problem. But I basically had to learn Logic and learn how to mix on this thing. And I d obviously I didn't take my own monitor, so I gotta say that, that so I u I used to this day these Ad Adam speakers. They're called P twenty twos, and they had that. And I just kept putting things out. And I thought I can I can actually understand these speakers. And even though this room is a mess, uh, I mean it, it it was really not an ideal room. There's nothing. What do you call it? Like the left and right, right. side are completely different. Yeah. So anyway, now the reason it was possible to make it sound good is time was not the issue. I mean, there was a release date, but it was their studio. It wasn't costing them anything. So the mixes stayed up on the board for about four days each mix. Wow. And I loved their yeah. music and, you know, the the feeling of being with them was fantastic. I mean, they they cooked their own food downstairs. They had this kitchen. It was very like actually being in France. Mm -hmm. um, lots of pots and pans with soups and you know you know it's wafting upstairs and it was just like it was like another react. You know, I, I, it was incredible and. Um, but there is something about that I find any time I go to a residential studio or just kind of lock yourself away to do nothing but concentrate right. on the music and be in a certain specific environment that it all contributes you're now your whole existence is in this one world it's focused solely on the music you put your entire being in it yeah. you're not distracted by the the, the sink that yeah. clogged up at home and you got to call the yeah. plumber there there's something immersive about that that yeah. it and it's just, just leads all music exactly it's all music yep. and vibe and feeling and there's none of the bullshit yeah i mean i'm lucky and i think you are lucky in this way as well that we work with artists that are characters and they're focused and the the, the bullshit level is is lower sometimes right. you get people who are you know egos and stuff but there isn't all that other stuff, but but there, I mean, this was an hour drive out of Montreal mm. in a, a, a village yeah. that had one street. Wow. And it only had two hotels. I was staying in one of them, and it was on the outskirts, and it was literally like some kind of psycho motel. <laughs> you know, it was weird. <laughs> and I don't didn't see anybody else staying there, <laughs> and there was no taxis to get there I didn't have a car so th so they had a bicycle so I'd cycle I'd cycle in this little village down the, down a country lane down down the village to their church which was the most beautiful classic church you know with a mm -hmm. steeple and all this and colored glass it was the whole thing and some of them slept there there was a couple of bedrooms downstairs um, and some of them would drive back and drive, you know. So you, each day there were different members of the band. So I got to know them all separately huh. and then together. And then sometimes we'd all have dinner together and listen to the mix. Yeah. So sometimes I was left there on my own for two days or three days with no band members. Um, there was just just uh, me and and the and the engineer. Yes. And uh, who had recorded it and. Um, I just left to my own devices to do whatever I thought, and then they'd come in and and win. Of course, is you know very much the 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 leader of yes, the band. Yes. And so he would listen, and you know, and he's a, co a complex complex person, super super imaginative, super bright, big ideas, and and incredible, 
you know, I think like what we were talking about earlier with the with he would explain songs to to me as in what it was about, what the feeling the f- was about. That's which is all the best, you want to know. Which is the best. That's all you he wasn't know. like, oh, can you put this echo and oh. do that? He was like, this song is about this. It's got to feel like this, and it's there's there's some politics involved, but this person is missing their lover or whatever it was, you know, and. Music-wise, I completely related to it because their influences were a lot of the bands that I sure. either worked with or, or grew up with, mm-hmm. and you know, I, and I, I just you know, I love everything about that band. And um, so, so, tell so me, worked, like some of uh, because the record really doesn't come across like a record that was made in a less than pro environment shall we say it really comes across as sculpted and crafted and right you know really like people were deliberate they knew what they're doing um did you have then were you doing a lot of experimentation and sending things out to amps or where they were i was certainly doing a, a bit of that but you know they self-produced in other words you know probably with win as the as the Guide, leader of, yes. of the of the gang of producers i mean they all had had input you know it, it, quite often i would be mi- mixing and i'd spend uh, uh, uh you know a, a bit of time with you know it could be anybody in the back just just trying this trying that and then win would come and hear it and like it or hear it and not like it, <laughs> depending on what had happened. And so the songs, this is how I would describe it. There was a lot of production ideas in the recording and the way the songs were arranged, but there was also too many ideas mm. and there was too much going on. And I think at the point when I came in, it had all got, they'd been working on it for a long time, and there was a bit of chaos and confusion in what what, what to use. So there was, uh, there was a lot of production uh, in, that had been recorded, a lot of ideas. And I remember, for instance, there was one song where uh, I'd mixed it, got it to sound good, and it had this string, you know, had a whole little orchestra Mm -hmm. with a crazy string arrangement really brilliant and 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 mixed it with that and it was all good and i thought it's it's good and then you know the band arrived win arrived listened to it and listened to it and he was like liking it and then the strings come in he goes wait a minute wait a minute what's he said what's that and i said it was the strings and he goes well what are they playing oh and then you know he called out to to their engineer co-producer Marcus Drabs says Marcus uh, says uh, what what uh, strings are, is on this record and he said you know he shouted up uh, he says I think it's the ones uh, from uh, Bulgaria and he said oh do you have the the ones that we recorded in Montreal and so suddenly yes they would be on drive three so up comes drive three and they open it and it's a whole other they had done two different version. string arrangements oh, every song had like the the middle section could be this guitar idea with this melody and a vocals that go with it or it could be a string thing so a lot of the songs had many parts to them so and you were the decider you were the the muter well i would say that i i would say that i you know came in fresh with fresh ears and i would do what i thought and then then win would listen and l- like it or not like it or then we do a combination of this and it evolved so the mixing was was very much like uh, it could, you know, the song could have gone either way, especially with that song in Intervention. Mm-hmm. I mean, that song, you know, starts off, it's, it's quiet and intimate and gets bigger right. and bigger Diver and bigger and dynamic. bigger, and strings come in at a certain point and different instruments come. It could have been, honestly, it could have been a very different track. And that song, I remember, took a whole week to mix. It was a very important song and a great song. Yeah. And it, I, I have very strong memories about mixing that song in particular because Wynn was 
walking up and down the uh, the studio the control room was actually long and thin and so I remember he was walking up and pacing, pacing just like yeah. like a dad about to have his first child and he wasn't happy and he was thumping the wall not not aggressively but like what is it what is it oh I can't I can't I've got to go for a walk and he would go for a walk and he'd come back and he'd say I think it's this I think it needs that and I, you know and I can't remember whether it was a choice between the strings and this or whether the guitar p there were guitar parts that for instance might come out in early and at the end of the uh, the end rev version of it they don't come until the outro and they come in loud and proud and they are the outro well that wasn't necessarily ha the intention the plan, yes, yes originally they came in from the beginning of the song so a lot of decisions were made between all of us mm -hmm on the mix and I mean some of the songs went this way and then that way and then they got scrapped and then bought back and then this so it was really really uh, exciting to be around and a lot of it was me navigating the dynamic of the people in the band mm -hmm. too you know because the win was definitely the leader but there were some certain members who pushed his buttons and disagreed with him quite a lot, almost to the point of like, are they disagreeing just to be just difficult? To, right. And I noticed that when that person wasn't around and Wynne would go off on his adventure, let's say, that he would then, Wynne himself would come back and listen to it the next day and then go you know what we what, what was happening before and it was maybe a part that they Richie had done that was completely a different thing and go that way a bit and that would end up being it so like I think R Richie in particular was uh, so he it's like they it's like they're best friends and they they lock horns right and it's the combination it's like lennon and mccartney right. all those kind you know you, you have need in every it. band you need it and yeah. and so i've you know i w i had to learn that i was like oh my god do i do i not do i ignore everything that richie says because when is going to fight it because they don't get on and then i realized no that's not it they're just both opinionated uh inspired people with great ideas and when you can get both of their ideas to work and they're both happy that is the yeah. best that song's going to be but we've all, yeah. all talked about this so many times how much of the production uh, is so much about psychology and understanding the people but Absolutely. it's always like extra hard for me when I'm mixing because right. somehow when when I'm producing I can see the dynamic very clearly and kind of orchestrate it but when I'm mixing I'm so deep focused yeah. in it that I think my patience is a little limited yeah, yeah. so I, it's also it's your time to shine it's it's all on you that's a good the point. pressure is on you the time's ticking the studio's usually expensive yep there's deadlines all this crap that's right. on top of you and that you're you have to ignore. aiming towards a finish line yeah you're like trying to yeah, rein yeah. this in trying to rope this in and all of a sudden you have somebody out here yeah. that's trying to take it left <laughs> and you go oh my god Derailing it means another it. three days yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and it's you know at that that mixing that record was i quickly realized they had pushed everything to the limit. They had so many ideas, and there was this dynamic between in the band with the different members going on. Not nothing heavy, nothing nasty, nothing ugly, but just a artistic difference of opinion. Uh, and so there's that going on. There were there was a time limit from the manager, like it's got to be done, guys. You know, we need to deliver this record. There was that, and but also. You know, I had to connect with Wynn in particular because, you know, you know, you have to prove yourself. Of course, yes. Because they don't, you, you don't know each other. Right. And, you know, you know it's so his I, songs. I, I mean, I'm sure I'm eccentric, but I don't know how eccentric I am. Wynn is, has an eccentricity. I had to learn where his head's at, 
the dynamic of he, he, how, how like he might have these great ideas, but he'll have so many that you know only one or two of them are going to work, and which are the most important. So, well, anyway, a lot you get it. A lot of a lot of that going on, and 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 time. Like I do remember intervention. So intervention, for example, had a Hammond organ doing the main part. If you remember that song, it starts off with this huge yes. church cathedral uh, pipe organ. But there was also Hammond, and there was they tried so many things, but the best sounding thing was this massive church uh, cathedral organ that they recorded in a, in a, in a church, or a, la a very large church nearby. And I'm talking like massive pipes, you know, and like, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, uh, Phantom of the Opera right, stuff, right? right? And it's so big sounding. Right, that there's no it, room it, for know, anything else. How can, and then it was like, well, it can't be that loud and it can't be that big because there's all these other instruments. We've got like, a, there's an orchestra that comes in, there's this, there's that, there's that. And I was like, oh my God. And so trying to fit it in, and then of course it didn't sound like big enough because it course. wanted to sound loud and proud. And, right, and, of course. Oh. A pipe organ is so a solo like, instrument. Okay, what makes it sound like that? And it's, it's the low end because the there's no this it starts off with it and there's nothing else. So the trick, and you know you you learn this by trial and error is when the song starts, it's all about that. It's huge, and as the song comes in, it gets smaller and smaller. But and you don't your notice, mind, but your you don't mind notice. remembers yeah. the intro yeah. and remembers how so there's important a lot it is. of that. Like yes. every entrance of every guitar on that song is loud and then it sinks in and that's you know this is the biggest is trick in mixing a right ve a very old school mixing yeah. trick is when something comes in yeah. you really announce it yeah. and then you put then it you in put its it place the level where it's got and, sit. and so yeah. your mind goes to that moment that you hear it first it feels important yeah. and then it just finds its home you yeah, know yeah. exactly yeah. yeah and so you know and this song i mean it, again, it was on Logic, which I had to navigate. Really, I only used no Logic as a multi-track because I didn't know about plugins and all that. And I don't, I, I honestly, it was so all the So all, all your all EQ was yeah. on the desk. The desk. Your desk. rides were on the desk? No, no the, so the rides were in Logic. That's what I thought. Okay. And I learned that. I had never mixed in the box before. So this wasn't really mixing the box. This was, it was almost like having a multi-track that had volume, <laughs> me volume memory. So the autom the fader automation was there. So I had to learn about like what's what's the limits of the desk, how loud can you put the inputs because it's, you know it's different, isn't it? Because suddenly if you've got your volumes going up and down like a mix does before the desk that means the louder it gets the, the more it's going to distort yes and so what's going on there so there's a lot of chaos mm -hmm. going and on and did you there. have a stereo bus chain yeah, I did. was there i have no idea what it was though i feel like it would probably have been it could have been something like an avalon or you know very often when you go to other people's studios they have like, odd equipment that exactly, you don't know exactly right but it it's, but you make it work yeah. yeah but i did mix it to tape it was mixed to an ATR uh, and to half inch, wow. which I insisted on because that's what I did at that time. I was still very much in analog yeah. world. And um, I honestly don't know if that's what was used in mastering. It's, it's possible that they used the digital mixes and didn't tell me. I hope they used the analog yeah. ones, but um, anyway, I, it, we, we don't know. But all I know is that when it came back from mastering, I, w I was amazed how good it sounded yeah. because I mixed it on a desk that I'd never used before that didn't, you know, have a lot of controls and in a room that was not tuned and but somehow it, it came but out. But there is something about that uh the Shins album I did was mixed up at this studio um in outside of Portland, Oregon and the control room was really like the size of a bathroom Jeez. but on top of it 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 had, the ceilings were like 16 or 18 feet so think about being in a small room with a huge ceiling it was really like being in a bathtub right. and you know i had spent at that time 
a month or two prior to mixing, you know, doing tracking and overdubbing. So I got used to the acoustics of it, but it was still a very live room. And I think the fact that I had to sort of fight yeah, my yeah, way yeah. through the acoustics of it, yeah. you end up with something that's very unique yeah, and yeah. doesn't sound like other records that you might have mixed in a perfectly tuned environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're just kind of struggling all the time and out of that struggle comes something really unique. Absolutely. No, I think there's a lot to that. You know, there's a lot to that. Some Sometimes you can be in a room and it's very frustrating because especially the low end, you just can't get the low end to work. I think I was really lucky that room, although it was bizarre, it had a vibe. Uh, and I always remember, like, I put the, the, the tracks up and, and it, the songs immediately, they're such good songs Great on songs that record. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, the, that, that record, I mean, that summer, Maybe that's you know, the most consistent record, yeah. you know, top to bottom. I think that rec yeah that record in the suburbs yes, is their best yeah. record. Oh, their first record is extraordinary. Yeah, though. different thing though. Yeah, De yeah definitely. Yeah. And I, I always found the first record was a little all over the map yeah. stylistically, and then later it's beautifully amateur. Yes. Yeah. In the in the way that we like all those great punk records to have that sort of like. You know, Loose. we all know that it could have been recorded or mixed better, but you wouldn't want to change a thing. No, definitely, you definitely wouldn't want to change. Very a few thing. records I would go but, yeah, back. Yeah, I mean, change. I have to say with with uh, intervention. So you know, I'm in this little uh, village, uh, and it, you know, this village. The thing I remember most about it is it started snowing. And it was so cold, and I the only way to get to work was bicy on a bicycle. Oh. And on, the, like, we worked on intervention like days and days and days, but there was this, we stayed up really late, like four or five, which on this song, and I got, and it, 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 it happened, it came together. Like, all the arrangement of like, what came in when, and the, very important, the bell sound, you know, there's oh, a yes. bell melody. Yes, yes, yes. And I remember editing that, and that became a crucial, important thing that, because lots of other things followed that melody. And unless the be that the bell part was way too complex, it was too busy, and I remember editing it down, hmm. and that was made a big difference. Anyway, we finished. I think when drove back to Montreal, I woke up late, and I remember the next morning, I got on my bicycle. The snow had fallen extremely. It was and. The roads were dangerously slippery. So I've driven up I, in Montreal yeah. many times. It's the worst. It's the worst. Black ice. And um, I thought the best way I can get to this, the, their studio, the church, was on the train tracks. Because there was a train. And the train went, I had to go down this little road to the train track. And I drove, I was on my bicycle with headphones on, listening to Intervention. And on this train track, <laughs> not knowing if a train was coming, by the way, so there's a risk to this. Um, and I remember I was just on this, and there's trees, it was just this beautiful thing, and I was listening to Intervention. And I, I, it took the length of the song twice. I listened to it twice, and by the time I got to where I could see the church, I was like, that's it. That is the mix, and, and if Wynn it comes in and with a it. whole other concept of using fight him? <laughs> it. I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do because if he doesn't recognize that, that, that is it. That's then, great. And I got in and then Wynn turned up and he's like, have you listened to the mix? And I said, yeah, it's perfect. He said, it's perfect. Oh. And Regine was there and they were all so happy and we played it back and yeah. that was it. And it is, it's an extraordinary mix. That yes. Yeah, it is. I mean, and it's, it's a very manual. Album. Yes. There's a, some manual stuff going on in that mix too. Uh, it's it's magic. Wow. And sure enough, I think it was the first single. I think it was the first thing released. It was released, I think, before the album, and it boom, it blew up. Yes, um, it was the the sort of teaser track. Yeah, actually. yeah. and it's yes. it's you know sometimes, and it, I'm sure you've felt this. There's sometimes there's songs and mixes and how they turn out that there's some magic there and you just know absolutely before the song comes out you know it's, got it's gonna that mojo. change absolutely things. and that song was one of those yeah. that changed a lot of things i mean they became a very big band yes. on that album and yeah 
Uh, yeah, that's the really that's the album. The first album sort of brought them to the critics and the sort of cult audience, but the second album, all of a sudden, it was stadium yeah, band. Everything fell into place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, not, you know, m most of the process of that album on other songs was a similar thing, but that one was the big one. That took. I mean, I'm going to say it took six days to mix that song. Wow. Yeah, with a lot of experimenting. Uh, it was just so much fun, man. Thank I'm you for inviting really, me. Really, really glad you came. Yeah. This is just amazing stories, amazing techniques. Well, we got we got the conversations we usually have in the hallways of recording studios around the world. That's the We've key. We've got it here it, what, those, with those cameras and stuff. Basketball courtyard yeah. conversations. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you.